With me uh, and Dr. Christine Moutier now is Jane Clementi, whose son Tyler was a student at Rutgers University, died by suicide in 2010 after being cyberbullied. Also joining us, he is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Um, Jane, I, so many Americans and so many members of, of the gay and lesbian community um, were so impacted by, by, your, by your son's death, and you've been very vocal uh, in, in the wake of this. Why do you think this crisis affects so many gay, lesbian, transgender youth? Um, well, as um, our foundation, we, my husband and I did start a foundation um, after Tyler had died because of all the great conversation that was started. And one of the things that we found is that um, gay youth are also more likely to be bullied. And it, of course, not all bullying situations end in the terrible circumstances that Tyler's did, but they still suffer great um, consequences. Mm -hmm. um, much of the same mental health issues that lead to suicide um, are what many of the gay youth that are being bullied do and which is why we are more interested in the foundation of going towards prevention to try and prevent um, suicide and prevent bullying in that respect so one of the things that I saw with Tyler's story was that there were so many people that saw what was happening to Tyler mm -hmm. and no one spoke up um, and then I learned when I started learning more about bullying is that People um, in most bullying scenarios have bystanders that see what's happening and they say nothing. So we want to turn those bystanders into upstanders. So that's one of our initiatives. Since. It's also hard for, I mean, we've talked to this about, uh, about this a little bit, for a lot of people to reach out for help. I mean, Tyler had recently uh, come out uh, and, and was obviously going through issues, cyberbullying issues, which, which he probably didn't even, he didn't talk to you uh, to about. To no, about. So it's often not. hard for somebody to... To, to reach out, they don't want to bother somebody else, even a close family member. Yes, and also we thought something about a tra that transitional time. He was no, he wasn't really fully acclimated into the culture of that, Rutgers. Those transitional times are really hard. Out and of school, into school. He wasn't at home. He wasn't in daily contact with family, with friends, and that transitional time is very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, I also want to bring in Jimmy Hatch. Jimmy uh, is a friend of mine, is Navy SEAL, uh, whose career uh, was ended after he uh, got wounded on a mission to try to rescue Bo Bergdahl in, in Afghanistan. Jim, you've been very open about uh, your struggles after uh, leaving the service and, and the help that you reached out for help. You had a, a circle that maybe you weren't even reaching out. They reached out to you and, and made sure you, you got help. And yet there's so many veterans who, who still don't feel comfortable speaking out because probably, I assume, because of a stigma. I think so. The military is a, an environment where we have to be critical on one another because of the stakes involved with the type of work we do. Uh, I think we always want to appear strong and not let anybody down. Uh, I certainly felt that way as though uh, by having these suicidal ideations and self-medicating, I was, was no longer capable of doing the work that I was in. I felt as though I had um, participated in making the, my last mission a failure. I took all this on board. You, you'd been, uh, I mean, you'd been a SEAL for 20 years, so you felt that your purpose suddenly had disappeared. Exactly, and I think it's not uncommon. Once we can no longer do that kind of work, we're kind of lost. It's a transitionary period uh, of our own. But, you know, my friends, the people that I worked with that saved my life in a gunfight, they reinserted themselves in my life after my wife ran out of options with me, and, uh, you know, nobody gets medals for taking their buddy to a mental hospital. Uh, but those guys showed up, uh, and they did it. That, that's one of the things you've said to me, and I, I, I love that, that idea that they give you medals for what happens on the battlefield, but for the people who are, drive you to the hospital every time you need to go, who stand by you, there, there are no medals for, for those folks. Right, and you know, the thing of it is, uh, it was mentioned earlier, if you got hit by the bus out here and you were laying on the ground with a broken leg, crying, you know, people would come to you and help you out. Uh, the mental health... Uh, circumstances that I was under, I wasn't really crying out, but my, my words were great, but my actions were different. And those guys who had been near me in gunfights and things like that, spent a lot of time with me in the past, they realized that in spite of my words, I was not well. And they came and uh, injected themselves into my life. Mm. The, the, the very high risk of, of middle-aged white men, uh, Sanjay, do we know mo much of, of why that group has become vulnerable? Well, we, we know in the, in the United States as a whole, life expectancy has dropped over the last couple of years, which is kind of an extraordinary thing because it's been steadily going up. I didn't know that. Over the last couple of years, it's, it's plateaued and then dropped. And if you start to really look at why that's happening, as you point out, it's really this 
It's the, the middle-aged white, uh, white working class population that seems to be uh, hit the hardest. Uh, they, they, uh, most common causes of premature death are liver cirrhosis, typically due to alcoholism, opioid overdose, and suicide, death by suicide. These are the, those are the deaths of despair, drinking too much, the opioids, and obviously suicide. Why it's this particular population in particular, it could be they've been hit harder by the economic downturn. There's um, uh, more stigma about actually going out and seeking help of some sort. These are the sons and daughters of the greatest generation. In many ways, they were supposed to inherit the United States, but instead they see them themselves dying at a faster rate than any of their sort of similar groups around the world. So that, that's, I think, part of what's happening here. Jane, you've been uh, very open about, uh, about what you yourself struggled in the wake of, of, of Tyler's death. Yes, I, I, I agree that I think that when you're in that deep, dark place of despair and isolation, that you don't see the resources that you have all around you. Um, our family was certainly warmly supported, um, and people from my community before Tyler died, as well as we've been warmly embraced and welcomed into the LGBTQ community as well. But when you're in that deep, dark place of despair, um, you don't see that res those resources or that support. And you, you had the impulse of, of suicide. I did. Um, because as a mom, I should have known what was happening. I should have known what was going on. I should have known. And the what ifs and the could haves and the should haves all just circled and spiraled out of control. How did you get um, through that? Um, I had professional help, which was great. Uh, I guess my faith, um, God was very present for me in that space. And Time, um, and it was just a matter of one moment, one day at a time, using other coping skills like journaling, um, professional help, as I said, being supported by friends and um, family members, which you don't really see. I mean, many people would say, "Well, you have two other sons, or you have your husband, you have so many people," but all I could feel was my loss, um, and I never felt like that ever before, and I was never not prepared for crumbling, my whole world crumbling apart. It, it, there are, I mean, science continues to look for breakthroughs, and there are some really promising, I mean, there, first of all, there, there, there are medications available right away now, um, but there's also a number of experimental treatments which, which hold a lot of promise. Well, you know, I mean, th this isn't so much a, a new medication, but something that's got a lot of new attention is, is ketamine, for example. And, and I've heard uh, doctors, other doctors, describe this as almost a rescue drug because of how quickly it can work. I've heard it, it, it in some ways stops suicidal ideation right away and so within hours you know so typically you know if you, you have the it's an infusion typically so it's through an IV um, during the day and then and then by the next morning typically it's it's the suicidal ideations are gone as people have described it's not that they're they're the problems or whatever may be fueling uh, their depression are gone but just that suicidal ideation is gone works totally different than typical antidepressants mm. Jane, thank you so much for, for, for being with us. And Jimmy, uh, as well, it's great to, great to see you. And Sanjay, as well. well